Okay, guys, thank you very much for listening. Good job. Well done. It's a good story, isn't it? It's always a good story when there's some fire. Oh, I, can't, I love how you guys sound when you're standing up. Come stand with us again. Let's go. Come on. Yes. Love hearing you guys sing. We will continue our journey through the book of Esther. Did anyone of you have the chance to read through the book? No? Yes, some, some, some yes, some no. Okay, well, those who have done it, probably um, you will sort of follow the sequence of, of the story. So, um, last week we kind of um, mentioned a little bit of the, um, the background of the book of Esther. And um, Joe, I don't have the clicker, so can you please just push the button? Thank you. And so um, when the story of Esther happens, the, the empire that is in power is the Middle Persian Empire, the one that comes after Babylon. So as you remember, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the division into what is known as Europe these days. So we mentioned that the, um, the king of Middle Persia, he was not happy with the Athenians, and so he organized a big army, 
And that army was led by Ahasuerus. And the book of Esther begins basically by saying that in those days um, when Ahasuerus was the king, um, he displayed his power and his uh, luxury and he called all the nobles and the princes and the leaders of his empire, which was from India all the way down to Egypt and part of Europe, uh, going through Jerusalem. So uh, it was a very powerful empire. And keep in mind also that they said that the laws of the, of the Persians cannot be changed. Whatever they decreed or whatever they commanded, it cannot be changed. So they were a very powerful empire. And so at this point in time, Ahasuerus is the king, and he is with a chip of his shoulder because the Athenians have already defeated the army of his father. And so once, once his father dies, he takes the kingdom and he says, I'm going to make them pay what they did to my father. So he um, organizes a mighty army and goes through, but once again, no success. The Athenians, uh, who knows the terrain, they defeated, and it was kind of a miracul miraculous um, defeat because they had about a million against just a few Athenians. Right there, as you remember, we mentioned that the Athenians, they sent a runner, uh, Philippides, uh, from Marathon to Athens to announce them, to, to announce to the Athenians that they have won the war, the battle against the Persians. And, and, and that is very famous because out of that run is that we now um, are enjoying the marathon that is in every single Olympic Games. So that's the background of the book of Esther. So what happens is that chapter 2 begins by saying, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti. And he remembered what he had done to her. So he remembered what happened to her. After these six months of meetings planning for the war, at the end of the six months, King Ahasuerus gives a seven days party. And they say that this King Ahasuerus was so generous that he let all the great and the small in the kingdom, uh, at, least, uh, at least those who were in the capital city, all of them were um, given food and drinks. And so all of them were drinking. At the end of the seven, uh, the seven days of party, as they were so, so um, lost of mind because of the alcohol, he called Vashti, his wife, the Queen Vashti, and he said, bring the queen so that she may show her beauty to you and to the people. Vashti said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to... Um, to keep my dignity and also the dignity of the king because the king is making that decision right now because he's drunk. But once he comes to his senses, he will definitely say, hey, why do you do it? So she didn't do it. However, he was embarrassed and he was full of wrath. And so he asked advice to the rest of the people who are also drunk and they say, well, uh, the best you can do, king, is uh, demote her from the throne. And 
look for a new queen. So, the reason why here he says, after these things, and by the way, from when Vashti was, uh, Vashti was um, demoted to when, to when Esther comes into the picture, have been four years in total. Four years. And so here he says, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus has subsided, then he remember. So how come that he remember after four years or three years? How come? Well, remember, he demoted the queen after the seven days party. And then he led the army. And he was in battle for two years. Then he came back, defeated. And so now that he is home, he now is, is missing something. Hey, where is my wife? I think I'm missing something here. And then uh, they say, well, don't you remember what happened? Uh, I was so drunk that I don't remember. Well, let me tell you. You sort of demoted her. She's not the queen anymore. So what should we do? Well, now you go or send messages throughout the, your kingdom and collect all the beautiful ladies and out of them all, pick the one that's going to be the queen. And so he was pleased with that. So he calls every single young, beautiful woman into the palace. And they are given a full year of pampering with oils and perfumes so that they will look beautiful. Uh, they were training how to treat the king, how to behave in the royal palace, and the whole thing. So, so they, uh, the, the story in chapter 2 is that as they go out and take all the young women, so there is, there is a certain man whose name is Mardokai in verse 5. And the Bible says that Mardokai, he was a Benjamite. And he was taking care of a young lady whose name was Hadassah, which later is known as Esther. Hadassah was his uncle's daughter, but because her mom and dad passed away, he took her into his care. So, as this happens, when the king is going to bring all the beautiful ladies to the, to the temple, Mardokai says to Hadassah or Esther, when you go into the temple, into, sorry, into the palace, into the palace, don't tell anybody that you are a Jewish. Keep that as a secret. Esther keeps that promise. She never says to anybody that she is from a Jewish descendant. So, <coughs> the story go goes on. And so, um, she was ob obviously trained. In the meantime, th this Madokai um, kind of, once Esther is in the palace, he is kind of going around the palace in the garden, so to just keep informed about he, her, um, his, his cousin Esther. And as, as that is happening, eventually, Queen Esther, well, at this, point in time, at this point in time, she's not a queen, but Esther, eventually, she becomes the queen. Now, it's is, is kind of a story that sometimes it doesn't portray the, a, a, a good set of values because on one hand, Queen Vashti, who supposed not to have 
a god as the Jewish people. She is keeping her in integrity. And she says, no, I'm not going to display my beauty, my body to anybody. Sorry, I'm not going to do that. And because, because of that, she's demoted. On the other hand, we have Esther, a Jewish lady. She's supposed to be faithful to God. And, and, and here she is being trained to spend one night with the king. And the training was how to please the king. Because whoever pleases the king, that will become the queen. So it's a bit of like what's going on. Don't you have a moral standards? Anyway, eventually she comes to the palace and she meets the king and eventually she becomes the queen because the king was very pleased with her. Madokai is still staying closer to Esther. And as he is sort of walking around the temple palace, he hears a plot. Two of those eunuchs are going to kill the king. He hears and he passed this uh, news to Queen Esther. Queen Esther in, uh, in turn tells the king, the king investigates and he finds that it's true. And so those two that were planning to kill the king, they are killed. And so the king makes his people to write that Chronicles, that event in the book of Chronicles, and it stays right there. In the meantime, the story continues, and chapter 4, um, actually chapter 3, is going to introduce a new character, and this man is Haman. Haman the son of Hamedatha, and then he says, the Agatite, the Agatite. So keep those two things in your mind. Mardukai is from the tribe of the Benjamites. Haman is an Agatite. Keep that in mind, right? And so it happens that he was promoted to be the prime minister. And as such, the king uh, made a command, a decree, that everyone will bow down to Haman. And so, everyone who was kind of in his path should bow down to him and show homage and respect. The only one that was not doing that was Mardokai. And so uh, <coughs> Haman is, 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 is uh, not happy because he's being told of what is happening. And uh, so Haman, he is trying to make Mardokai to bow down. And Mardokai says, no, I won't because I am a Jewish and I'm not going to bow down to anybody. But at the same time, I think it was not only because he was a Jewish, but also Mardokai is a Benjamite, and Haman is an Agatite. What that means? Well, it happens that years, years before, when Saul was the king, God asked Saul to eliminate all the Amalekites. And so Saul goes with his army and he destroys all the Amalekites, but he leaves 
the king alive. And the king's name was Agag. So as he is left alive, obviously he had a good chance to have babies. And this Haman is one of his descendants. So obviously Haman, he knows the story of what these Benjamites did to his people. And on the other hand, Madokai, being a Benjamite, he knows very well who this Haman is from. So we know who you are. Forget it. I'm not going to bow down to you at all. So, because of that, Haman is not happy. And so, he plans to destroy all the Jews. What is he planning? What is he planning? To destroy who? All the Jews. Okay, tell me. Who are, back in, back in those days, who were the Jews? God's people. God's people. What do you think will have happened if all the Jews were destroyed back in the story? What was that? Sorry. The promise that God made to us to send his son to save us, it won't happen. Because the promise said that from the Jewish people, he will send a deliverer. So the enemy just, is just right there trying to uh, stop Jesus to come. If Jesus is coming from these people, I'm going to destroy them all. So he plans to destroy God's people. And then in verse 8, listen to what it says. Chapter 3, verse 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, pay attention to what it says. There is a certain people, a certain people, is scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. These people, these this certain people, they are everywhere in your kingdom. And then he says, their laws, their laws are what? Are different from all other people's. And they do not keep the king's law. Therefore, it's not fitting for the king to let them remain. Are you following the story? It's not good for you, king, for them to remain alive. So, if it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they all be destroyed. Are you following the story? So he wants all the Jewish to be destroyed. And verse 10 says that this Haman, the son of Hamedata, the Agatite, he was or he was the enemy of the Jews. And then verse 12 says, uh, the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the month, of the first month. And a decree was written according to all that Haman has asked them to do. And that is to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jewish people of the empire. Let me ask you a question. Are you awake? Yeah? Because when I ask you a question, I just suspect an answer. Okay? 
Does this decree, this story, sounds familiar? Yes? Familiar to what? Okay, let me take you. Let me take you to. Well, first of all, um, uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go to Matthew. But remember when Jesus wa uh, when the disciples ask Jesus, tell us when is the end of the world, end of the second coming. Do you remember what Jesus said? Do you remember what he said? What was his answer? Tell me. Can, can you please give me a list of those things that Jesus said? It will happen before his second coming. Tell me. Come on. Sorry? As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days before the second coming. Tell me. What else? Sorry? The, the, book, of, the book of Daniel will, be, will, will become alive. What else? They'll be eating and drinking. What else? Focus on chapter 24 of Matthew. What did Jesus say? Sorry? The gospel, is, the gospel is going to be preached. What else? Take care or watch out that no one deceives you. There, there will be famines. There will be wars. There will be Earthquakes, there will be, that, okay, and what else will be? Lovelessness, and what else? Tribulations, yes, but you're missing one thing that I want you to, 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 to pick up. Sorry? Love of money? Sorry? You will be hated for my name's sake. And then he says, you all are going to be what? Persecuted and killed. Is it the same thing here? In the book of Esther? The enemy trying to destroy, wipe out God's people? Yeah? And so, when you couple the story of Esther... With Matthew 24 and Revelation 13, it, 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 this story is a warning for us because uh, Revelation 13 says, especially uh, from verse 11, it says, Then I saw another beast. And this beast is coming out of the earth. Had two horns like a lamb and a spot like a dragon. And he, this beast, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. And who is this first beast? Well, the one whose deadly wound has been healed. If you want to know a bit more and to find out who this beast is, we need to go to Daniel 7. And you will find that this beast is the one that is going to persecute God's people for 1,260 years. Is going to try to change the times and the laws. And the, and the only commandment that we know that contains time is the fourth commandment that is about the seventh day, the Sabbath. Are you with me? And so here, this second beast <coughs> is going to make the whole, world, the whole world to worship the first beast. And, 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 and for us to make sure who this beast is, it says, the one who, whose wound has been healed. And um, you know that, you know that 
it was um, something in history that says that on the 12th, so sorry, on the 10th of February, 1798, the system that was governing the religious and political arena completely suffered a wound given by General Berthier. General Berthier, all the way from France, crossed the Alps, got into Rome, and took the Pope captive. Then he took it all the way back to France, and he died right there. Every, everybody was saying, oh, this despotic power has finished. Now we are free. But that wound has been healed. Has been healed. So the second beast is going to give power Sorry, the first beast is going to give power to the second beast. And the second beast is going to make the whole world to worship the first beast. And then he says, then he says, and he, the second beast, deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the saw and yet lives. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both uh, speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? Killed. Are you following the story? Haman, the enemy of God's people, made a decree to kill, to destroy, to annihilate God's people. Jesus says that in the last days before he is coming, God's people are going to be persecuted and are going to be killed because of his name's sake. And Revelation, Revelation 13 says that this <coughs> second beast, who is going to receive power from the first beast, is going to make the whole world to worship the first beast. And whoever does not do it is going to be killed. Do you find any uh, parallel between these stories? It, it, you follow the story? You follow, you follow the, 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 the gist of it? And then he says, <coughs> He, second beast, causes all, both a small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then he says, here is wisdom. If you want to understand, ask God for wisdom, ask God for understanding. Don't just jump into conclusions, no. Praise God that God has given us the Bible, and the Bible explains itself. So that means when we study the Bible, we should study the Bible with the Bible. And that is how we're going to find out who this beast is, what is the mark, and what is going to happen. Anyway, <coughs> well, it happens. It happens that um, Haman, he is definitely um, completely upset. Uh, he is angry against the Jewish people, Mardokai especially. 
And so he deceives the king, and the king makes him to make a decree to destroy all the Jewish people. When Mardokai comes to know, and the Jewish people around the empire, they are mourning, and they are in sorrow. Now, apparently, the queen, Esther, she doesn't know what's going on. The only thing that she knows is that Mardokai is with this sackcloth, with ashes, and whiling. And so she says, well, what is going on? Send some messengers and inquire. And Mardokai says, well, um, are you the only one who does not know what Haman is doing? He's going to destroy us all. So you should go and see the king and tell him what's going on. Esther says, well, I cannot go because there is a law that says that no one without being asked can just come and pop up to see the king. Mardokai responds to that and says, well, hey, what about if God has placed place you just right there as the, as the queen for such a time like this? And if you are not willing to go, let me tell you, let me tell you, one way or the other, you are going to perish. But let me tell you one thing, Esther. Even if you don't go, I know that God will save us, that God will send a deliverer from somebody else. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> the story is interesting because Mardokai, at the beginning of the story, we know that this Mardokai, he supposed to be in Jerusalem. Because by this time, they all have been allowed to go back to the homeland. But Mardokai, he probably is in love with the luxury that he probably is enjoying. He probably is having a good life in, in Susa. So he says, no. I don't want to go back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is destroyed. Too much hard work. Sorry, so you go. I'm okay here. So it shows that this Mardokai, he was not so faithful to God, hey. And yet, it's interesting that in this time of crisis, he takes God seriously. And so, and so, the story continues and says that as Mardokai says to Queen Esther, if you don't do anything, God will save us anyway. So, Queen Esther asked all the Jewish people throughout the empire, and she asked, hey, I want you all to fast for three days. Once again, remember, what we said at the beginning of this series, that the one of the things in the book of Esther is that you will never find the word God. So God is not in the book at all. And the second thing that you will not find is prayer. It mentions about fasting. And by fasting, we kind of conclude that when we fast, we pray. But the word prayer is not there. Neither the word God. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like in this story, it seems that God is out of the picture. And so, and so as they pray, because they are praying and fasting, Queen Esther comes to see the king. She, uh, he is pleased with her and asks her to come. Yes, queen, what would you like? Well, king, if you are happy for me to uh, invite you to a dinner tonight, then I'll tell you what my request is. And uh, the, the request is also for you to come to my dinner together with Haman. And Haman says, oh, wow, 
Ooh, the queen is inviting me to this party. And so he goes. <laughs> so he goes. And he goes home happy. And he says, hey, I got power. I got riches. I, I got influence. And, and the, 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 uh, I've been eating with the queen and the king. So I'm, I'm, I'm very special. But one thing, one thing, I really don't, you know, I got everything, but one thing doesn't make me feel happy. And this, and this is this Haman, uh, this Mordecai, because he doesn't bow down to me. And so he shares this with his family, and his wife and his friends give him an advice. And the advice is, Okay, Haman, if you want to destroy these people, or especially Mardokai, uh, we have an amazing idea. What is that? Well, you build a gallop. That's what you call it? A gallo, gallo, no gallop. A, a gallo, okay? <laughs> That's the one. You build an, a, a gallo. And once, once is finished, bring Mardokai and hang him right there. And he says, that's a brilliant idea. I'm going to do it. And the story says that he made these gallows 50 cubits high. Do you know how high that is? 26 meters. Imagine, 26 meters. It's, that is high. Why so high? I think he's trying to make a point. Hey, everybody, this is how we treat those who don't bow down to me. And you need to learn the lesson because I'm the in power. That's the message. So, Coincidentally, the very same, same night that he is building that gallo, the very same night, the king cannot sleep. He goes to bed and he's tossing to the right, he's tossing to the left, and he's going to sleep. And so, what a coincidence that he asks his people, his servants, to bring the chronicles of the kingdom and please read me something out of the Chronicles. And what a coincidence, isn't it? What a coincidence that whoever is reading picks exactly the story when Mardokai has given the news that the king will be destroyed by these two eunuchs. What a coincidence, hey, that he cannot sleep, that he wants somebody to read to him. And the one who is going to read, read precisely the chronicles where Mardokai saved his life. And then he asks, has anything been done or given to Mardokai for such an act? And they say, no, nothing. Because, see, <coughs> it was in his duty to give a reward to Mardokai as much as his duty was to put down anyone, anyone against him. So, in the morning, very early in the morning, when he woke up, then he hears somebody coming to the palace. And he asks, who is the one in the garden? Uh, Haman. Oh, Haman, yes. Call him, please. Call him. Hey, Haman. Hey, um, I, I want you to help me. I want you to give me an advice. Yes, king, what is it? Tell me. What should I do to the man that the king is so much pleased? And Haman, in his heart, he is saying, Oh, who else will the king be pleased but me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And so, because he thinks he is the one, O okay, king, for the men that you want to please, or, 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 or that you are so much pleased with, I suggest you to bring a royal robe 
and put it on top of that person. And then choose the best horse, the best royal horse, and make this man to ride on this horse and pick the best men of your kingdom to parade this man on the horse around the city saying, this is what the king does to the man that he has, is pleased with. Because he thought, I'm going to have this glorious moment. And yet, when he finishes, the king says, that's an amazing idea, Haman. Oh boy, that's what I love you because you are my best man. So can you please make sure you do exactly what you have said to Madokai? How do you think he felt? Oh goodness me. And that's what Madokai did. Hmm? To his very best enemy. The story says, at the end of the day, he went back home with his face full of shame and he covered because he didn't want anybody to see him. He went home trying to find consolation in his wife. And his wife says, if you have begun to fall before this Marokai, who is a Jew, oh boy, you are down, down, down destruction. And so, as they are saying this, the story says that the servants of the king came to pull Haman back to the palace. I think he forgot about it. Because he was busy. He was getting late. So they broke him up. Hey, hey, hey. Time for dinner. Oh, yeah, dinner. Yeah, okay, well. Whew, okay, well, at least I'm going to have a good time here. So he goes for dinner. And right there, as they are having the dinner, the king, Esther, Haman. Once again, the king asked the question, Queen, I'll give you half of my kingdom. Up to half of my kingdom. What is your request? Uh, no, sorry, I don't want your kingdom. I want to save my life and the life of my people. What? What is going on? Yeah, well, there is a certain man in the kingdom, in your kingdom, that he is seeking to destroy us all. Oh, really? And who is that man? That one there, Haman. Oh, Haman? Haman, at this stage, he is, he knows he is done. As the king is furious, full of rage, he goes out. Haman throws himself on the couch and asks Esther for forgiveness, pleading, please save my life, save my life when the king comes in and he sees Haman kind of pulling probably the robe of his or, or her legs, he says, are you even trying to assault my wife in front of me? No way. At that point in time, they come to get him, put a cover on his face, boom. And as they walk out, the servants said to the king, oh, king, by the way, yeah, what is it? Well, it happens that uh, Marok, um, Haman has built a gallow 26 meters high, and the purpose was to hang Madokai in it. And the king says, Woo, that's perfect. You hang, hang him right there. S you see the story, how it goes. Now, to finish, where is God in the story of Esther? Where is it? Where is he? 
when you read the story, you don't see that God, Elohim, or Adonai, or Yahweh, appears in the story. And yet we know that God has been in the story from the very first moment. And it appears that everything happens by a coincidence. Let me tell you, for God's people, there is no coincidence. Because for God's people, God is in control and he takes care of his people. So, what an amazing story because it is so relevant to our days, isn't it? So relevant to our days. So, so many people are uh, scared for what is happening. And, um, and by the way, you know how the, king, the king's decree to worship and... And Revelation says that the, the second beast will make everybody to worship the second beast. And if you, if you have clear in your mind who the first beast is, you know that at the moment with this, with this um, greenhouse effect, they are, they are saying that we have the resp responsibility to look after our own house. And that is, you have the responsibility to, to take care of this planet. And therefore, they are seeking to set a day aside so that everybody will have a rest and to give this planet a rest. Tell me, if that is going to happen, which is going to happen, what day do you think they are going to choose? Sunday. How do you know that? Because, it's <laughs> because that's what is uh, that they are keeping at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says there are a certain people scattered around the kingdom, around the planet. And these people, they have different sets of laws. And these people don't keep the king's law. Do you think it's talking about you? Because instead of Sunday, you keep Sabbath? So, It's not that, it's not that we are instilling fear. Rather, we are going according to what the Bible says, and God has already given us a warning. And this warning is not for you to be full of fear. Rather, the warning is to say, hey, Make your life right with God right now when we have time. The time is coming. And it would be too late, perhaps. So right now, my friends, is the time to make things right with God. To be faithful to God. To make <laughs> whatever it takes to have a full commitment with our Father. Don't let fear to creep into creep up into in, 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 into your being. Instead, have faith in God and the hope that He will deliver us, that He will take care of His people. And even though we don't see God in the picture. Because he's, he is an invisible God. But let me tell you, God is there. In every single detail of our life, of our government, our planet. May God bless you.
Okay, you know what? Even though everything's coming to an end, which is a great reflection from that. Everything, everything is coming to an end. At the end of everything is the beginning because uh, before everything began, there was the one. And let's stand up and sing about our peace that we have with that one.
Awesome. God bless you as you go out into this week and uh, stay strong, stay together and praise God when He comes soon. Amen.